How's everybody doing? Great, everybody awake? I know after lunch can be a little tough. Um, so yeah, I'm Jake, um, and I'm going to teach you about the exciting, dynamic, amazing world of fine-grained app permissions that scale. Is every, everybody's still awake, all right, cool. Uh, a lot of people are like, well, we're not really scaling, so maybe this talk isn't for me, but you probably are. Uh, most people are scaling either with traffic, that's the really obvious one that everyone knows, you can also be scaling your development velocity if you're trying to get more done per unit of time with a bigger team. You might be scaling feature requests, so you really don't want to have your app permissions be the blocker for generating new revenue. And finally, maybe you're scaling geographically. So if you're getting customers and new geos that maybe you didn't think you would, these can uh, create new challenges for your permission systems. And most of you will be scaling on at least one of those dimensions. Um, CockroachDB specifically helps us scale with traffic and geographically, so I'll talk a little bit about that today. But before we get into that, a little bit about me. Um, I'm co-founder and CEO of AuthZ. AuthZ is the commercial entity behind SpiceDB. SpiceDB is the project to doing those fine-grained app permissions. Um, formerly, I was at Red Hat, Google, Amazon, CoreOS, uh, Boeing. Um, and I've primarily been working in APIs and developer tools. Uh, I've been doing it for over 15 years, so I've been doing this stuff for a while. Um, and where I really cut my teeth on application permissions was when we built a product called Quay. So Quay was the first private Docker registry. It was even before you could get private Docker repos from Docker themselves. Um, so uh, during the genesis of that project, as we entered the growth phase, things like that, we really found out how your application permissions can end up being a bottleneck for the whole company. Um, just a fun fact about Quay, Quay was bought by CoreOS, uh, that's where I worked at Jim. CoreOS was bought by Red Hat, Red Hat was bought by IBM. All of a sudden I'm at a 400,000 person company and I'm thinking maybe this isn't the right place for me anymore. So let's go start a new company and that's what brings me to you here today. So first I want to talk about application permission evolution. Um, many of you uh, probably started with or are currently have a monolithic application. This is a really critical phase for finding product market fit and being able to iterate quickly. Uh, it's, it's where we basically all started out. Um, after you reach the scaling limits of that, you might move into a microservice oriented architecture. So you start breaking things apart, teasing them apart, uh, scaling them individually. Once you've got that sort of network service layer there where you can call these different services, you might start exploring multiple different languages. This can, uh, there are languages that are better at things than others. You might want some components in Rust, some in Go, some in C, who knows. And finally, uh, you'll probably at some point have to deal with the challenge of global distribution. Um, this is something that we ran into in Quay, something that we're running into in AuthZ, so a lot of people will eventually run into this. So just to start, um, before anybody runs up here and attacks me, this probably isn't actually your code, uh, but it is representative of what a lot of authorization code looks like in monolithic applications. So we have a simple function. The function takes the list of allowed users. It checks if the current user is allowed. If so, returns true. If not, returns false. Um, then we've got a piece of code that's interfacing directly with the user. It's just a handler. This is going and reaching out to the database saying, get me all the authorized users passing that list to that authorization function that we were talking about, and then based on the answer of that function, we're determining what to do with the data. Should we tell the user, hey, you're not authorized, or should we tell the user, here's the thing that you asked for, here's the response, okay? This is actually where a lot of the people who come to us to talk about application permissions are today, right? So a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of companies in this space, and it makes perfect sense. But at some point, you exceed what the monolith is capable of helping you do, and you decide to move to microservices. When you start to think about how your authorization is going to happen in a microservices world, there's a few different strategies. And I've seen both of these out there in the world. Uh, one strategy is that all of your microservices can still call into your monolith for authorization. So this has a lot of attractive properties. Um, the first and foremost is that you keep your database access isolated, and you keep a single copy of the authorization code everywhere. Um, this allows you to continue making consistent decisions, but you can end up with a priority inversion. So you can end up with like super tight loop critical uh, service needs to go out and talk to the big slow monolith that's actually handling end user requests in order to say this is a go or no go uh, for a particular authorization action. So what we see more commonly out in the world is we see people take that authorization function and put it in a library. 
So that's what I have there in the lower right-hand side of the slide. Uh, I just took that authorized function from the monolith and put it into its own package. Um, this is a piece of Go code, but again, it's only an example, so it doesn't really matter. Um, so now that we've got that in a library, we can start compiling that library in with all of the services that are going to use it and all of the services that are going to make authorization decisions. This is great. Now we can make authorization decisions in a federated manner. So right where the user is trying to access the code, we can go and we can ask the authorization library, is this user allowed to do this thing based on the rules you have encoded? Um, and it, the library will say yes or no. Um, some of the downsides of this approach are that you still need an implementation per language. So if you're starting to explore adding more languages to your stack or picking languages that are better for certain purposes, you need an impl implementation for each one. It can also complicate the rollout of changes to your authorization code. So imagine in this authorization code that we want to change it to allow super users or something. Uh, now we have to go and update that library for every language and we have to roll that out to all of the services almost at the same time in order to still be making cohesive decisions. But nevertheless, we persist. So here's what it looks like to use that uh, authorization library. Um, so we're just importing it in two different services that may be dealing with user traffic. Um, but one thing to note, and the reason why I even made this slide, is we still have to go and we have to talk to that database that's storing all of our authorization facts, the database that can tell us which users are authorized. We need to talk to that from each service, and then we need to feed that data back into that uh, authorization function that we're now sharing. Um, and then similarly, we have a disposition where we can either give the data back to the user or you know, perform an archive as this archive service is for. Um, Okay, and like I mentioned, you do need one implementation for language, so I just you know, translated this into a couple different languages. But you can see the complexity and the ongoing burden of having to, when you want to change your authorization logic, you have to update this function in all of your different languages, and they all have to match, right? So they all have to be doing the same thing, making decisions the same way. A bug in one is gonna be a real head scratcher of a bug uh, when you start saying like, well, this works in the archive service but fails in the user service or vice versa. Um, and this is just an ongoing cost that you'll continue to pay over and over again every time you try to mutate and roll out new versions of this code. So the natural step, the next step, is to make auth its own service. Um, so this gives you all of the things that, you, you know, all of the properties that cause you to make other things their own service. You get that out of making auth its own service. So you get that language independence. You get unified decisions. So if you have one service that you're calling out to, that service can make uh, the same unified decisions the same way, regardless of who's calling it. Um, this makes a lot of sense, but it also comes with some downsides. Uh, the authorization service is going to be taking a lot of traffic. Almost every other service is going to have to call the authorization service. So this becomes a critical path uh, to latency. It's like Jack was saying earlier, everyone needs to talk to the user service. Well, everyone needs to talk to the authorization service. And if you have a high latency on that service, it's just gonna keep adding up and making your requests slower and slower. So that's a thing that you need to definitely keep your eye on and keep uh, tight controls on. And also it can, come, it can become a single point of failure. So when you have this authorization service, if, you are, uh, if everything is calling out to it, if that authorization service goes down, it's like basically the most critical uh, piece of your architecture. It's right up there with logging. Right, so if the authorization service goes down, nobody else can get any work done. And not only that, everything is reaching back out to that database. We have to figure out how to be able to get this data all across the world to be able to answer these authorization decisions quickly, no matter where our users are. So this is a huge, tra uh, huge challenge. We can't have the source of truth uh, only located in Iowa if we have users out in Australia asking authorization questions. So what do we do? I'm sure a lot of you probably already know because of where we are today, but. When confronted with this exact question, Google went off and they said, I know, we'll take that authorization service and we'll build it on top of a globally distributed database. So they did just this, and then they wrote a paper about it. Um, Google is amazing for writing papers about things that are super useful for the rest of us. Um, I mean, we're all here because they wrote a paper called Spanner, and I'm here because they wrote a paper called uh, Zanzibar. Um, but when Google needed this globally distributed database to back their uh, global permission service, what did they choose? They chose Spanner. So I've updated the architecture diagram to show what this probably looks like inside Google. I don't have any uh, domain knowledge even though I, I was a Googler. Um, but I do know that the Zanzibar, the authorization service called Zanzibar, 
is talking to Spanner, and they've put all of the data related to making authorization decisions in a separate logical database, away from the rest of their business logic. So they've isolated the data for making authorization decisions, and they've made it a completely isolated, separate uh, network service with its own domain that they concentrate on. We still have our other services, and those other services are talking to their own business domain databases. At Google, this is probably also Spanner. They use a lot of Spanner at Google. Um, it seems like a pretty solid architecture decision. But if we look at why they chose Spanner, um, there's a couple different properties of Spanner that were important for making this decision. And I'll relate each one of these things to authorization specifically. So why Spanner? There's no single point of failure. Spanner is a sharded, globally distributed system. Um, and you need there not to be a single point of failure because the authorization service needs to be highly available. Right? If it goes down, everything else goes down. Uh, Zanzibar runs at Google with five nines of uptime. So this was clearly a good decision on their part. It needs to be highly scalable. So like I said, every request from every service is probably reaching out and asking questions about authorization. So you need to be able to scale not only with user traffic, but probably with some multiple of user traffic. Um, in the Zanzibar paper, they talk about doing 20 million requests per second against their authorization service. So you need a, a, a t that type of database to back this type of service. Um, we have global asset transactions. Why is that important? Because changes to authorization, changes to the, the permissions that you've given out about your data are very sensitive. They're very important. You don't want to accidentally give someone access to something that they shouldn't have. For example, if you revoked someone's access and then you changed the original thing that they were, you know, that they used to have access to, you don't want to give them access to the changed version of that document. You don't want uh, latent, stale decisions being made. Um, similar to, similarly to why we have the next point, which is no stale reads. Uh, that might sound familiar to people in this room as well. But we want these things to take effect immediately. Right? We want to make sure that we're giving the freshest authorization decisions when that freshness is something that is absolutely required. And finally, Spanner also supports point-in-time queries. You may know this from CockroachDB as as-of-system time queries. But point-in-time queries are really important for us to be able to make the same decision over and over at the same point in time, or to be, ev to be able to evaluate multiple things uh, later on as they existed in the past. Okay? So we, we have to be able to go and say, did this user have access to A at this point in time and also B? And we don't want to accidentally interleave decisions that were from two different times, because they could, again, uh, lead to users getting access to things that they shouldn't. Okay. Um, does any of this sound familiar? Do any of these uh, points on the left sound familiar for a database maybe people are interested in? I don't know. So anyway, uh, we set out to build SpiceDB. So SpiceDB is to Zanzibar as CockroachDB is to Spanner, and that works on two different dimensions. Um, as Jim mentioned, CockroachDB is based on the Spanner paper or heavily inspired by the Spanner paper. SpiceDB is heavily inspired by the Zanzibar paper. We use CockroachDB as a backing store in SpiceDB, because we needed something to fill that spanner box in our architecture diagram. So we chose CockroachDB to do that. Um, it's a highly available globally distributed service, so we need a, needed a database to match. Um, in SpiceDB, you can model all different kinds of permissions. So you have RBAC, RBAC, ABAC. These are probably things that maybe some of you have heard of. You can model all of those things on top of SpiceDB, our permission service. And normally, I'd go into a big pitch about our schema language and how to model these things and do it all. but um, I'll save you some time because this is a, a cockroach talk after all, um, but I highly recommend that you check it out. And it's easy to check out because we're an open, service, open source service written in Go, again, just like CockroachDB. So there's our GitHub repo at the bottom. Uh, if application permissions are a thing that you care about, I highly recommend checking it out. And if you're so moved, I highly recommend uh, contributing. Um, just one uh, little point, uh, kind of interesting point is that the Zanzibar paper was so good and so interesting and mapped to so many of my challenges that I've experienced in the path, past that I literally quit my job and started a company around it. So highly recommend the read and checking out our repo. So um, I thought I'd have to do a lot more explanation here, but we have a lot of the same whys about why we adopted CockroachDB as the previous speakers. Uh, so a global service needs a global database. Right? You want to put the data close to your users so they're not, that you're not waiting hundreds of milliseconds to be able to make these authorization decisions when the user is waiting on an answer. 
Also, the HA architecture of Cockroach is unparalleled, right? Any node can take traffic. Um, if you're using follower reads using as of system time, a lot of nodes can answer those queries directly without having to go to a different node to get the authoritative data. Um, and it's horizontally scalable just by adding uh, more nodes. And obviously, you all know the story about how Cockroach got its name, so it's also durable and reliable. We wanted that as well. But as you adopt anything, uh, there are some lessons to be learned. So these are just a few of the lessons we learned about CockroachDB, um, the hard way. So time is really important. And I don't just mean that in like, uh, you have an app server, you understand clock skew, time is important, blah, blah, blah. No, I mean it's like really, really important with a distributed system like this. So clock skew directly leads to problems, clock skew directly leads to latency, et cetera. Um, and then we found out also that unlike Spanner, only overlapping transactions in CockroachDB are linearizable. Um, and there's a, a subtle but important difference between uh, serializable and linearizable that doesn't make, sense, uh, make a lick of difference for most use cases, but is really important for us. So just while we're on time, um, I went into our Cockroach Cloud uh, dashboard and I pulled out some node latencies as measured by the different Cockroach nodes talking to each other. So this is over the period of what looks like about 10 minutes. And you can see that on the left, the scale is measured in microseconds. So these are, really tight, um, these are really tight clock offsets between our nodes. This is running in Google Cloud. Um, presumably, they're NTP services backed by uh, atomic clocks and whatnot. So these are really tight, really good tolerances. And these lead to great performance in CockroachDB. But if we zoom out a little bit and we look at a month's worth of data, uh, you can see that every once in a while, we get some pretty severe spikes. Um, so we regularly see spikes of 10x the latency. Um, and these spikes are large enough that they can cause some issues with the types of queries we're doing, but not large enough that Cockroach will decide to evict the nodes altogether. So what kinds of issues can they cause? Um, like I said, they're not large enough. So the, the Cockroach cloud, as we have it configured, or as it's configured for us by the Cockroach team, will keep nodes unless they ha their clock skews exceed 250 milliseconds. 1.4 milliseconds is way under that. What kind of problems could it be causing? Well, for one, we found that overlapping insertions can start to fail when Cockroach can't resolve, uh, sort of, the, uh, can't, can't come up with a resolved order uh, to create those transactions. So even without evicting the node, we can find that latency can directly impact the success of our queries. And also, we found that queries between nodes can appear out of order. There's a article or a blog post, or I don't actually know what I found, but in Cockroach, you can find that they don't want you to use as of system time with really recent timestamps. And the reason is because those system times can be not propagated, unseen, or they can even appear in the future for other nodes that are processing that data. So these were some things that we ran into as we migrated and adopted. Um, I had a whole other list, but I'm out of time, so. But speaking of overlapping transactions, um, we did write about this because it was important enough for our use case and important enough for what we're doing. Uh, so Evan, who is one of the engineers on our backend team, wrote a blog post about this one crucial difference between Spanner and CockroachDB. Um, I won't get into it here. Uh, it's definitely worth the read, though. So if you're interested, just take a picture of that URL, or it'll be in the recording, uh, and then you can learn about it there. What I want to leave you with, though, is that without CockroachDB, there never have, may never have been a SpiceDB. So when I told people, hey, I really like the Zanzibar paper. I'm thinking about leaving, quitting my job, and going and starting a company around it. They're like, oh, cool. I've also read the Zanzibar paper. What are you going to do for Spanner? Um, and the ability to point at CockroachDB and say, look, there's already something in this gap filling this need for the public uh, was really important in giving us the confidence to go out and to start our journey and to create this company. So I just want to say thank you to the Cockroach team uh, for even making this possible. And that's all I have. Um, that's my email address. Thanks. That's my email address if you want to talk more about application permissions or if you prefer something a little bit more real time. We also run a community Discord where we talk about Zanzibar, Cockroach, distributed systems, SpiceDB, all of those things. So I highly uh, would encourage you to join. You can find me there at, at Jake Mashenko. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>